our wood cut so far and uh should I be digging a hole into the side of the mountain just as well, just in case? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I have questions about the 300 mile an hour winds. They're going to hit on the, the the solar wind side of the planet. Uh, according to the Mayan prophecy, the Earth is going to be between the sun and this rift. There's going to be a solar flare, and we've been having some great prominences lately. Not solar flares, but these are coronal mass ejections that are really spectacular. Without the presence of this extra gravitational force, they're just wonderful to watch with the SDO. But with this gravitational plane, they won't go a few hundred thousand miles out into space. They'll go several million miles out into space. And now we're not talking ordinary flare. We're talking about something on the, on the, on the magnitude of what you saw in the movie Knowing. But it won't be the whole Earth. It'll just be the, the sunward side of the Earth at that time. We don't really know where that's going to be. We don't know how strong the wind is going to be. So I wouldn't be buying a bunker. But uh, because you might be in the wrong place with that bunker. You may, we'll have plenty of warning to know where to move. You just have to be able to move. You know, nobody wants to be a burden on FEMA and upon the emergency services out there. If you've got your own stuff, and you got a little planning, and you got some place up in the mountains where you know you can go, and you can, or a family farm off in the in the country that you can go to. Put most of your food storage out there. Give yourself a 72-hour kit, and start walking. And how far inland do you think you need to be to, um, you know, say worst would, case scenario with tidal waves? I would go at least 20 miles, and I would try to go at least 200 feet in elevation. At least 20 miles and at least 200 feet. So if you're living in Florida, move. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know down in North Carolina now. I'm not. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, I originally resided in, in Hampton Roads, Virginia, and uh, I, I kind of saw the writing on the wall, and I'm like, this is probably not a good place to go <laughs> or to be. So so uh, I up and moved, and um, and now I'm inland probably about 40 to 50 miles inland um, but as far as elevation is concerned where I am uh, elevation is uh, I mean I, I live in the great dismal swamp so <laughs> oh yeah there's there's so no low lying areas will, will definitely take take the, you know the brunt of the water we're, we're at about 850 feet here and about 250 miles from the coast oh so yeah you sound pretty safe as far as that's con that's concerned but um, uh, what kind of warning signs will we see, do you think, from Well, you know, we're already seeing them, but we're kind of being cooked like the frog in the, in the lukewarm water. Uh, right. We're seeing the earthquakes increase. We're seeing the temperature swings uh, from summer to winter go worse. This is the hottest June we've had in 50 years. It was also the coldest winter we've had on record ever since since time has been measuring winters here. So we're seeing extremes in either direction. We're also looking at the other planets. Saturn's atmosphere has increased 30% in atmospheric pressure in the last 18 years. That's incredible. That, that is incredible. Wow. But as we get closer, what do you foresee some of these... Um, what can you? What do you think some of the symptoms will be? How do you know when we're getting close? I mean, a lot of people don't have access or don't know where to find the information. You know about the the sun activity. Is there a place that you could tell them or a website they can go to to I, monitor I this use, information? Uh, I use spaceweather.com. They they monitor uh, the sun's weather 24 hours a day, so you can see what's going on. Uh, you can also go to the SDO, that's the Solar Dynamics Observatory website. Uh, they monitor the sun 24 hours a day. Uh, so those are places where you can get some information. Uh, right now, there, there are two observatories in the U.S., one in, in, um, in Australia, and they're getting ready to launch one. It's actually about five years behind schedule. And these are called the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories, or short, uh, shortened is LIGO. They have one in Hanford, Washington, which is a, a, a geologically very quiet area. And they have one in Louisiana, which I believe is back online now. 
And when, when these work in concert with one another, and it's important that they do, they cancel out earth noises and they only pick up space noises. And what they're trying to do, now they've got them down to where they can detect the vibration as small as a, a tenth of a proton. So they're very, very sensitive. What they're looking for are these gravitational waves coming through our neighborhood. They've, they're good enough now where they can detect coalescing neutron stars, but we can, we can pick those up with radio antennas. This one will be good enough to pick up a black hole. And October of this year, they're supposed to be sensitive enough that they think that they will pick up their first black hole. We've never actually directly observed one. They're theoretical. And we theoretical physicists are rather fond of them. We would like to directly detect one. <laughs> um, the last time I was up there and met with uh, Dr. Fred Robb, he's the guy that runs that, uh, that observatory in Hanford, they were very confident that they were getting close and, and quiet enough with their detector that they could pick up a gravitational wave. That let was me, our best warning device. Let me ask you this. How do you calibrate something like that? What's your what's your baseline? I guess I, I, that that's my question. The interferometer, um, if you don't know, or say you, you're trying to measure for a black hole and black hole exerts this force, and and the interferometer is measuring, I guess the difference. Uh, maybe explain what a, an interferometer is and how it works. Sure, and, sure. Because that would on be. One second, I'll I'll tell you what that is. Right. Okay. An interferometer is, is a single laser beam that is aimed at a special mirror and split into two beams. So like a framing square, the two beams go out at a right angle. Now these observatories are very big. The, the mirror that they reflect off of is four kilometers away. So each leg of the framing square is four kilometers long. Wow. And it's down a tube that they suck all the air out of. So these are vacuum tubes, four kilometers long. The, the light beam goes to the end of this tunnel and bounces back, hits the source mirror, and goes back out again. And it goes back and forth enough times that that beam is about 20,000 miles long. And then it, at the end of that, it's, it's sort of sawtooths back and forth across these mirrors till it gets to a pinhole that it goes through and the two beams are interfered with one another. They're put 90 degrees out of phase so that a peak hits a valley and you get nothing. You actually get a dark spot when these two beams cancel each other out. Mm -hmm. And the lasers are so, so carefully monitored that they will not vary more than one millionth of a wavelength. That's how <laughs> stable they are. Wow. You should get a nice black dot unless space-time ripples. If space-time ripples, one leg is going to vary a little bit more than the other leg, and you're going to get a little signal. Now, that can happen when a truck drives by or when the ocean crashes or lightning or thunder or an earthquake, but it's not going to happen at all three observatories at the same time, Australia, Louisiana, and Washington. When they get a signal that happens at all three observatories at the same time, that came from space. Now, these observatories are laying on a round ball, the Earth, two in the northern hemisphere, one in the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And they're at least 3,000 miles apart. What this gives us is triangulation. So that when this occurs, we can locate that gravity source instantly. Wow. That's uh, that's pretty impressive. So they can and it took actually. took a lot of money to build. I can imagine. A lot of, it took a lot of money to build, and it was the brainchild of Dr. Kip Thorne. He's way on up in years now, but he's the brain guy that put that big project together. Nicholson and Morley were the ones that originally built the first interferometer, and it was to test Einstein's theory that the speed of light doesn't change in the universe. They were actually testing the ether theory to see if the Earth's motion through space dragged sunlight and made it slow down. And they proved 